Welcome to the Brenda Perryman Show right here on TV 33, WHPR, Comcast 90 in Detroit and Oakland County. Your mom can watch it if she has Comcast. And um, we're also streaming live courtesy of the World Wide Web, www.tv33whpr.com. And we invite your questions this morning. I have a very, very interesting show for you today. First, my, I'd like to tell you my second guest is Dr. Margaret Betts, so she'll be on. Get your medical questions ready. And then I have as my first guest someone I've known since she was 13 or 14 years old, and that's Miss Victoria Reese. Hello, straight out of California, <laughs> uh, straight out of Compton. Please don't say Compton. Compton. No, <laughs> I'm not. Good morning. How are you? I'm great. It's so good to see you. When did you get in? Um, I got in really late Tuesday night. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was, uh, it, uh, so you, did you take the red eye or? Uh, no, it wasn't a red eye. I actually had a layover in Denver. So I left pretty early in California time and got here pretty late this time. So. Well, let's give the audience a little bit of your background. Okay. Um, you went to Southfield High, right? I did. Well, guys. <laughs> yes. And what did you enjoy about it? Oh, I knew you would ask that question. Well, okay. I just, I mean, <laughs> because it had something to do with other things that you do. It really did. It really did. And I wanted to speak on that. I'm glad you asked. I, um, my favorite part of high school was performing arts, which I got to work with you on, um, and acting, actress of the year. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was my favorite part, um, because I think when you're performing, it's so much more than just getting on stage. It's really who you are, a reflection of who you are, and understanding other people and how to interact with other people. And you taught me that, so thank you. And teamwork, and you got that too, being, you work with the band? Yeah, I was a major in the band, and I was the captain of that, and then I was on Pom Pom Radio. I did a lot. You I, did, you I were did very, so very active. And wouldn't you, would you say the students should continue to be active in school? Very. Because what does that get you? Um, it, it really, as an adult, you have to work with so many different types of people. So being in all those organizations taught me how to work with all those different types of people. And I got to travel. Um, I'm well-traveled because of all the organizations I was in. And even with acting, going to different high schools, I met yes. so many different people and performing in front of different people and um, learning how to perform in front of different audience. Some people don't care. Some people really do care. <laughs> and you still have to do a good job You regardless. still have to do that good job. Mm -hmm. And you were in the beginning of the teen dating violence mm -hmm. piece, right? Yep. I think I was like the second group to do it. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. And uh, I think you, yeah, you were the second group. Yeah. Yeah. And um, what did you learn from that? Because I never forget, you came up to me one day and said, I broke up with so-and-so because... He verbally abused me on the <laughs> stairs, you know. You so, had me using these words that I don't think kids knew. <laughs> I was verbally abused. I, I know. Do I mean, anymore. that's what you said. I know. You said I can't do this anymore. And I just said, well, whatever. It was, uh, you know, the drama of high school. But mm -hmm. after you left high school, you went to a historically black college. Yes, I went to the illustrious Howard University in Washington, D.C. And when you were there, what did you major in? Legal communication. What is that? It's a very small major. Not many schools have it, but um, they felt I wanted to be an attorney at first. I knew I wanted to get up in front of people and perform in a way. <laughs> and I really do like uh, politics, law, things like that. So I majored in that so that I could uh, use it as like a pre-law. Um, that's what most of the pre-law students did, went to legal took legal communication um but it taught me a lot of debate classes like that's really all i had and then i had law classes so it was an amazing opportunity because i was giving speeches all the time and doing debates trial. so you know how to speak in front of people yes what is the value of that a lot of people are so techno technologically savvy and they do so much with the texting mm -hmm. and all this stuff but what about that one-to-one -one or one-to-group communication mm -hmm. Um, interpersonal communication, um, it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about what I learned from your classes in acting. Um, reading people and understanding people and um, understanding the value of people is so important and it's very limited these days because of social media and digital like technology, things like that. It's important. It, I think it ruins a lot of the relationships we have because we're so dependent on it. And it's nothing like a good you conversation. You do. You think it ruins a lot of the relationships in what mm -hmm. way? I mean. Because we're dependent on that and we're speaking through a phone and you, um, I think 
seeing someone say certain things is amazing and you take it for really what it is when they say it to you and how they say it and if they really mean it and you'll never forget how they said it to you how they looked when they said it I think those things I think I get dramatic from you <laughs> well <laughs> you know those things are so important well they are important because when you want somebody to do what you want them to do you have to be able to persuade them you have to be able to come up and talk to them in such a way that uh, it doesn't alienate them and so mm -hmm. forth you want them to come over to what you have going mm -hmm. now so you're you left Washington and you went to New York right yes right after graduation I went to New York I ran to New York <laughs> why I guess I'm like a hopeless romantic um, but with the city I watched movies and TV and I just thought that was the top place to go if you're you know a fashionista and you're young and you just want to go in the city and take over the world and that's always been my mission just kind of take over the world like you always were a little bossy <laughs> I still am but um I just thought like that's the city where you uh, where dreams come true and it's fast paced and exciting and I really um, wanted to work I know I wanted to work in entertainment or something like that so I wanted to go there to give it a try so what happened I did it for the most part. My first job was in advertising, so I got. To you were with Ann Taylor, or no, no, no. I was um, at Universal McCann, and okay. my client was Kohl's. Kohl's, yeah. okay. Yeah, so um, that was exciting, amazing. Advertising is a great industry um, for a person who's right out of college because it's a lot to do. It's fun. It's pretty creative. So it's, it was great. And didn't you start a business there? Mm -hmm. I started my first business like a year after graduation, um, and it was marketing and PR with my best friend, Jamel Franklin. Shout out, Jamel. Um, <laughs> but we both were in New York. He was a year older than me. Um, we're really great friends, and I really respected his work ethic. So he did the marketing portion of the company, and I did the PR portion, and it was called Millennial Effect. So that was my first little business. So now you're in LA how many years did it take before you got to LA I was in New York for two years and I moved from New York on the day like the same exact day that I moved there so I left it it was a, a an exact two-year mark which was really awesome um, and then I went to LA and I've been there for almost three years Wow so when you were in LA what took place what did you do first second in LA yeah. Um, so I got to L.A. because I got a job at William Morris Endeavor Entertainment, which is uh, the first and oldest talent agency um, booking all the celebrities. So back in the day, they had Marilyn Monroe. They had everyone. And today, right, right. today they still have the uh, A, you know, A-list clients. Well, was the job what you thought it would be? Yes and yes. <laughs> like, um, you, I read all the books about being in the mail room and going to talent agencies and how it can be really um, belittling and challenging and competitive. And it was all those things and more. Um, I left because I realized I don't want to be around things like that. I don't, um, I think it's hard enough to be a black woman. And I didn't want to be in an industry where I was invisible. So. <laughs> right. You, well, you could tell by your history, you always like to be out front. Always in the front, always. And, um, but after that, what did you do and, and where you are now? I want to get to where you are now, and I want to talk about the challenges you faced. Okay. So after I was at William Morris, I really realized that I did not want to work for anyone anymore. Like, I knew that I wanted to work for myself. Um, and I really discovered myself moving to L.A. because I had a business before. I ended up going to L.A. I couldn't really do that business anymore because I was away from my business partner. Um, and I didn't really want to do the PR. I know how to do that. That's something, everything you know how to do doesn't mean that's what you're supposed to do. You can have a lot of skills. That doesn't mean that's your passion or your purpose. Tell me about it. <laughs> so um, moving to L.A. gave me opportunity to really hone in on what I was good at and what I liked and what I didn't like. So Working at William Morris, I knew that I liked to negotiate deals, and I knew that I liked commercials and endorsements and really placing people um, in opportunities that best fit them and um, maximizing their streams of revenue. Mm -hmm. So when I learned that, I'm like, okay, this is what I want to do, but I just need to do it for myself, and I need to work with people that I respect and admire. And I, I like their works. So I will be proud to represent them. So um, I started Victor Group, which is a brand and creative services company. Um, it's my company, and it's just me. Um, and that's exactly what I do. You're the only employee. I am the only employee. 
and what do you do? Tell us. Mm -hmm. So it's a brand and creative services company. On the brand side, I do brand consulting. Um, branding is packaging. For example. Um, for example, I have a client who's a really good friend of mine. Um, she's, she's coined the term inspirational explorer. So I've helped her from the ground up create this job for herself. So she didn't have a job. She wanted to travel and she wanted to find a way to um, generate revenue from traveling. How can I do this? How can I just travel the world? How can I create a job for myself? So I basically helped her from the start create a lane for herself. So whether that be, um, we'll have Honda, we'll hire her to drive a car on a road trip. Right. That helps her travel. Right. But she's now paired with a, a company to do that. And she's like a personality, a travel personality. She went to Iceland and and she had a photographer capture that. And she inspires people to travel because a lot of people, they vacate, like they try to vacation, but they don't travel. And it's two different things. Right. Because traveling is. is exploring. And traveling is really trying to see the world because if you've been in Detroit your whole life, it's a bigger world. Oh, much it, bigger. It's a much bigger world. You Even know, if you because go to the next Detroit state is such a small town. Everyone yeah. you know or meet knows somebody yeah, else you know. Your grandmother was friends with the, her I, grandmother or something, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. Now, um, you started meeting some challenges, health challenges, mm -hmm. and I want my audience to know about that. Mm -hmm. Could you talk mm -hmm. about that? Um, so when I got to L.A., literally nine months after I got there, I was working at William Morris. It was really stressful, and I started having numbing in my leg and numbing in my face. I didn't know what it was, um, and I went to the doctor, and they told me that it was stress, like stress from work, and my hair was kind of shedding, and they could not figure out what it was. So I went back a few more times to get MRIs to see what was going on, and they told me that I had multiple sclerosis, and stress triggers it. So I probably always had it, um, but it comes out in your 20s and stress really induces it. So I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and I had to really change my life, um, lifestyle. And in what respect? Um, well, in a few ways. The first way was I, I never took medicine. No Tylenol, Advil, that just wasn't my, I always wanted to be healthy. So I'm not taking any chemicals. I don't want to take any medicine. Um, and then, so I had to self-inject medicine, which is giving myself a needle every day. and. I had never done that. Like, I would get. What a was shot. this medicine meant to do? Well, so there's no cure for multiple sclerosis, but there are medicines to help you prevent having flare ups, which is most what pe mostly what people with MS have. Um, the kind that I have, I have relapsing remitting, meaning I'm not always sick, but I might have a flare up. So the medicine is to prevent you from having extra flare ups, but it won't cure it. It just tries to keep you normal and health healthy. So, um, have you had many flare-ups? I've had a few since I've, um, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> I've had a few since I've had it, but nothing crazy, nothing like the beginning. I think now that I understand that I have to keep my stress down, I have to work out and eat healthy, that I understand how to maintain it. But um, the biggest challenge with it was understanding that I wasn't Superwoman or that Superwoman has challenges too. I know. It was an ego thing. Like, oh. I have to, like, I'm not powerful, like, or I am a little fragile, like, I have to take medicine. That was the biggest thing for me. So you took the world by the tail, mm -hmm. and you said, I'm going to keep on doing this. You didn't come home. I didn't come home. I, I did come home, like, just to be with my mom, because I think sometimes when you tell your loved ones that you're sick, they're scared, and I was so far away. I, I feel like I needed to be there for my mom, too. <laughs> so I did come home, but I didn't come home, like, to move. I stayed right. in L.A. I didn't want to be one of those people that felt defeated because it was, it's not over for you if you're sick. And then I also feel like people are inspired by resiliency. And they under, like, when they see that you didn't let this get to you, yes. then, you know, some people have, you know, you're supposed to be a servant. You're supposed to find your way to be a servant. And I think that that's one of my ways to be a servant. Like, you can be, you can still be cute and fun and <laughs> live in L.A. And just, <laughs> if you have multiple sclerosis, you don't have to be in bed depressed. You could still keep going and prom promote being healthy and just keeping it going. So how did you change your eating? Um, well, I I don't, bas I basically don't eat red meat anymore. I don't eat meat, period. Um, I I love salads always, so I always eat salads. And for the most part, just making sure I'm eating things that give me energy, that give me life. Not, like, no fast food, um, no fried food. Yeah, it's basically things like that. <laughs> right, right. But you feel good. I feel great. 
That's great. That great. is so great. And um, you you just come for the Christmas time. And then weren't you here another time this year? I was here. My grandmother passed yes, in May. I'm so sorry I was about here. that. No problem. All right. Sorry that, that I heard about. I was very sorry to hear that. Yeah. So you have a challenge. You know, sometimes I think with challenges, people work harder if they have them. They could either go down or just stay up. Mm -hmm. And I know for myself, because I've had challenges, I'm having one right now, really, but I just try and keep it moving because I think if your morale, you keep your morale up, that helps your, you know, your frame of mind. It's all about the frame of mind. My mom always preaches that. Like it's about, it starts, happiness starts with you and how you respond to things is a big deal. It's a, it's a reflection of who you are and it really does help you get through things. If you decide to be the victim, then you'll be the victim. If you decide to be the conqueror, you'll be the conqueror. And I decided to be the conqueror. Oh, wow. That's good. So you you work for someone, yet you have your own firm. You don't think that that's a lot to do? I mean... It's a lot, but I can do it, and it's all a path. But you to... like it. That yeah. That's half the battle, <laughs> that you like what you do. I'm serious. Yes. That's half the battle. Yeah. Because somebody asked me, said, why are you coming here this way? I like it. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah, that's important. I had a conversation yesterday about liking what you do. We spend so much time at work and so many years working. If you really do the math, you spend most of your time at work, probably more than with your family. So you, I think that you should like what you do. And I also went to school to have a career, and I have student loan payments <laughs> that, oh, yeah. are, you know, that reminds me every day why I went to school, to have a career and to do something where I'm using what I know and what I'm good at and what makes me happy to help other people. And that's what I strive to do. So I don't mind having more than one job. So what could you tell other young people who are in a rut or just maybe they missed after high school, they didn't go to their first or second semester of college. They kind of hung out and got a job, but they want to do better. They don't want to be stuck in this job. What should they do to pull themselves up and try to start moving, make it start happening? Because mm -hmm. sometimes people act like it's too late. Yes. I would say the first, like the word you just said, start. Um, you have to start somewhere. If that means you're just brainstorming and you're writing down things that you like to do or the things that make you feel fulfilled, um, that's where you should start. And never, like, never wait. Never wait. Never have an idea and wait years and say, I just, I don't have it. I can't start a business. A lot of people actually, and I was taught confidence. Like, you taught me confidence. My mom taught me confidence. But a lot of people will say, I can't do that, or I'm not smart enough to do that. What? Like, I've never heard that. I've never heard anyone say that. How do you feel that about yourself? And if you don't know it, learn it. Pick up a book. Go get a mentor. Mentors are really important. So if you don't know it or you don't feel confident in it, there are resources out there for you to become confident. So I would say to start because if you wait and wait and wait, and wait, then you'll never do it. And you spent your whole life waiting and you were just working a job and not working a career or working your passion. So I would say just to start, it's never too late. It's, you can watch, pick up the TV remote and turn on the TV and you'll see there's a lot of people who started late, but they started. And that's but they started. Mm -hmm. it's, it's never too late. Mm -hmm. And I've heard people, I've seen people, cause I'm on Facebook, call themselves a loser. Oh. You know, they say, I'm just a loser. I, how do you do that? How do you say that? How do you let yourself get there? You, I'm, I'm sure you thought of yourself as a loser well, before you I even said it. I think sometimes, you know how they say they're haters in the house, mm -hmm. or you know sometimes people in your family can say, "Oh, you can't mm -hmm. do that." Yeah. Um, or people on the outside who don't wish you well. Have you ever had that? I wouldn't say that I've had that because I think I have a great support system, and I think. Um, you should always keep people around you that are positive and that uplift you and that give you energy. So I wouldn't say that people close to me have discouraged me, but sometimes the people closest to you can discourage you because they don't see your vision. And it's important to understand that like distant kind of love, like, all right, I won't talk to you about this because you don't understand <laughs> it, you know, right. as a like my generation, as a millennial, we're, we're all we want to be innovative and creative and entrepreneurs and not, you know, quit our jobs and start our own companies. Sometimes our parents don't understand that it's hard to explain what branding is. It's hard to explain, look, I want to do this and I'm going to start my own job, like I'm going to create my own title and just do it. 
it's hard to explain to your parents that when you spend all this money to go to school and that's not necessarily what you went to school for, but you kind of have to just know you pray about it. But you can pull <laughs> skills from the mm -hmm. things you did. Oh in yeah. School. Yeah. You can, I can definitely pull skills from my, but some, there's a lot of people who went to medical school and they kind of fall out of love with it after five years. I know. And they, they want to go do something else, you know, and sometimes it happens like that. It's unfortunate, but, <laughs> but it, happens like that. it is schooling. It gives you an opportunity to see if I like this mm -hmm. or not. You and you know? can use your education to help people in a different way. Yes, you can. So where do you see yourself in five years? On top of the world. Um, <laughs> I see myself, um, my company will be growing. I would have a lot of A-list clients. And you would see my name. Like, I, I want to be in the forefront. Like, I want to show people um, what you can do, and I want to inspire people. So even though what I do is, like, a, the background, like, I help the talent, I still want to kind of be in the front so that I can tell my story and that I can help people because I don't think you can really do that from the back. You can't. <laughs> no, you can't. Some people try, but it's hard. Mm -hmm. Well, Victoria, this has been really <laughs> inspirational. You had a lump in my throat. <laughs> I'm serious talking about this because I, I know how active you are, and I know you've always been active, and then you come down to a place where you can be, I mean, MS can take you, you know, just the thought of it can bring you the down. The fatigue of it. Yeah, and the fatigue of it. But you found a way to work mm -hmm. with it. And that's laudable, very laudable. And um, I want to thank you for coming this morning. <laughs>